In this lecture, we're taking a quick, brief look at Red Sea ports. Uh, we know a lot more about these than we did, let's say, 20 or even 10 years ago. Uh, but we're going to look at uh, three of the ports that I'm most interested in because they relate to the shipwreck from antiquity that I excavated in Eritrea many years ago. That shipwreck is uh, at Black Asarka Island down here in what is now Eritrea. Uh, this is a um, site that is related to the Aksumite port of Adulis, which we'll get to. And it's related to at least two other sites, Bereniki in Egypt and Aqaba, also known as Isla, uh, in ancient times in uh, at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba in what is today Jordan. All right, Berenike, it was one of the most important harbors on the Red Sea coast from the 3rd century BC, the Ptolemaic period, um, and up until the 6th century AD, uh, that is the time of the Islamic conquest of the Red Sea, when things shifted. From here, trade was conducted from Ptolemaic, that is the Ptolemaic Greeks who uh, took over Egypt after the uh, conquest of Alexander the Great, and Roman times between Rome in the Mediterranean, of course, this was on the trade routes, Alexandria at the head of Egypt on the head of the Nile, uh, Arabia Felix, which is what the Romans called Yemen. They called it Happy Arabia because that's where things like frankincense came from, which is a very valuable commodity and which you see turning up in the Bible because it was valuable. It was like gold. The Aksumite Kingdom, which was the ancient kingdom in what is now Eritrea and Ethiopia, centered on Aksum, with the port city at Adulis, as I mentioned, and the Indian subcontinent. So people were sailing from Berenike down the Red Sea across the Arabian Sea, which is what the northwestern part of the Indian Ocean is called, over to India to trade. Okay, in 275 BC, Ptolemy II, king of Egypt, founded this shipping port on the Red Sea coast and named it after his mother. Very nice thing to do. The most important reason for creating this harbor was the need of the Ptolemies for elephants. These were used in wars. They were warring against the Seleucids, who were in the Near East, Syria, in that area. Another uh, inheritor kingdom from Alexander the Great's empire and they were blocking the import of Indian elephants, so they went down the Red Sea to capture African elephants. And they found these in what is now Eastern Sudan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. And then they shipped them up the Red Sea on special ships called Elephant Tagoi to land them in southern Egypt and then walk them to the Nile Valley. So there were elephant trails going across the eastern desert of Egypt at this time. Some of these ships wrecked on a number of reefs and islands along the west coast of the Red Sea and were eventually, well, the elephants would die and eventually these were swallowed up by siltation uh, and became parts of the island. So somewhere out there, these elephant transport ships are lying on these, on the shores of these islands buried in sand. It would be marvelous to find something like this because had to have very big, strong ships to transport all these elephants. <clears throat> this is where Berenike is on the Egyptian coast. As you can see, it's protected from the north by this peninsula sticking out into the Red Sea. Uh, so this is a natural harbor. It's surprising that it wasn't really developed before the age of the Ptolemies, because the Egyptians had been sailing on the Red Sea since... Um, early Bronze Age, Neolithic even, we're not quite sure, but they were sailing there that early on. So, but they never made use of this. They did have harbors further north, which was perhaps more convenient to their power centers on the Nile. Furthermore, dangerous shipping route over the Red Sea, which with its treacherous coral reefs, as I just mentioned with the elephant transport ships wrecking on these things, Pirates operating from the Arabian Peninsula. We know that they were coming out of there. In fact, ships of the Ptolemaic period, at least, were armed with archers to repel 
pirates, it was a very big problem. So just as you see pirates in let's say Johnny Depp movie, um, or you know Hollywood movies or stories like uh, uh, Treasure Island, there were pirates back then too, raiding ships as they went along. So this all made it desirable to have a safe landing place as far south as possible still within Egypt. And that's why Berenike was placed here. It was far south, it had a protected harbor, and it had land routes over the eastern desert to the Nile Valley. In the Roman period, Berenike developed into a trade emporium. Uh, so it moved away from elephant use, which the Romans didn't use that much anymore. And from here, they brought in spices, myrrh, frankincense, pearls, and textiles. Uh, these were all shipped into Berenike, then overland to the Nile, up the Nile to Alexandria, and then loaded on ships and brought into Rome. We know aspects of this trade from textual evidence. There's a tome called the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea. We don't know who wrote it, but we now have settled on a first century AD date for this. And this lists the various harbors along the Red Sea, the East African coast, the South Arabian coast, and the Indian coast, as well as commodities which were in demand in each of these emporia, that is these trading centers. Okay, in all periods of occupation, archaeologists have found that the inhabitants of Berenike had access to luxury items. So this meant it was a rich place. Figure you have all these goods coming in, all these goods coming out, all these middlemen settling in this town, this port city. Well, they were getting rich. We find finely decorated glass, imported ceramic fine wares, houses, although they were built out of fossil coral. Well, you're going to build out of what's locally available, right? Um, and sand bricks, chips and blocks. They had rich tapestries, some of which we've found in excavations. There was marble flooring. Marble was imported for this uh, from places like Asia Minor, Turkey. And food was imported over the uh, desert from the Nile Valley, a distance of 375 kilometers, I uh, figure 200 miles. There was water. You can't have a port without water. Water was the fuel of ancient ships. I don't mean the wind, but the fuel. If you don't have water, people are going to die in three days. So you had to have water sources. In fact, water source, sources is one of the reasons why harbors are placed where they are, particularly in desert-type areas like you get in the Red Sea. Uh, if you have to sail more than three days and you run out of water, you're in trouble. So harbors, even small little harbors, was set up at various places where water was available. That was, seemed to be, in this area, the primary concern, more so than, I'd say, protection from the elements, the wind and the waves. Okay. Water was the number one concern, as it is pretty much today. It really is a very harsh desert along these coasts. coasts. Okay, water was supplied by a number of wells at the foot of mountains of the eastern deserts. Water does tend to form wells at the base of mountains, even in dry areas. You may have to go down deep. But here they were eight kilometers, that's six miles west of the town, so it wasn't a big chore to get in water. So again, this was a pretty ideal place. Seems to have been inhabited until the end of the 6th century AD, that is until... That would be, what, 599, let's say, around that time period. And even in this latest phase, phase of occupation, trade contacts were extensive, although on a smaller scale than the major Roman periods of activity, such as the early Roman era period, 1st and 2nd centuries, and the 4th and early 5th centuries. Then things tended to die off for various reasons. Siltation, climate, uh, political changes, religious changes, um, things like that. All right, let's move all the way north to Aqaba. This is Isla. You'll see Isla spelled two different ways. One is A-I-L-A. -A. This is Isla in the late Roman or Byzantine period. And Isla, A-Y-L-A, -A, was its name in the Islamic period, okay, which is the 
uh, starting late 5th to early 7th centuries. Um, much of it's obscured because it uh, lies under the modern city and much of the Byzantine city underlays the early Islamic occupation. Now, Isla wasn't conquered by war in the Islamic uh, conquest. Uh, they actually, the powers, the Byzantine powers of Isla reached an agreement, a treaty with the Muslims who had camped outside the city because they didn't want their city and livelihoods destroyed. And so we, uh, the tra treaty basically replaced the power structure with a Muslim one, an Arab Muslim one, over the Arab Byzantine one. So the cultural material, the styles of the pottery, um, the artwork, um, and even the economy remained unchanged at first, changing only gradually over the course of the, the next century. And this continued economic prosperity is suggested by quantity of imported goods. We still find tableware pottery from North Africa coming in from Egypt, uh, things from Asia Minor, Cyprus and Egypt, and importation of amphorers from Egypt and Palestine also continues. So goods were still flowing into this area um, throughout the Roman, Byzantine, and early Islamic periods. It was a very important place. By late 3rd century, Isla seems to have been producing its own transport containers. While they were still importing containers, amphors from Palestine, Gaza, which was a big wine-producing um, region during this time period. Believe it or not, uh, Gaza and the Negev Desert even, we find remains of the wineries there. But they started creating their own amphors, uh, which we now call Aqaba amphors. Uh, also known as Isla Axum Amphors. So if you look in literature and you see these two terms, they're, they're the same thing. These reached the entire length of the Red Sea, and they were found on the shipwreck I told you about, at Black Asarka Island in Eritrea, and other areas uh, in Yemen, Bereniki, um, other poor areas uh, in uh, the Red Sea, even in India. Some of these made it to India, although some people believe these belong to the early Islamic period rather than the Byzantine period. I have my reasons for doubting this, which we won't go into here because it'd be lengthy. It would take an entire hour to explain. Um, nevertheless, um, these things lend support to the view that there was a vigorous commercial activity in the region throughout these time periods in whatever was being sent in these amphors. We tend to think of amphors as, as carrying wine. Now, of course, we know that they carried other things. They carried uh, salted or pickled meats. They carried figs. They carried various fruits, uh, grains even. Uh, they could carry oils like olive oil. Um, so we don't really know what was carried in these amphors. Although, as we'll see in a subsequent lecture, that uh, it, it does appear that these were carrying wine. There were kilns found in excavations uh, in the mid-1990s in Aqaba, uh, including uh, ones that had these amphors, these Aqaba amphors in it. Um, the kilns supposedly produced these amphors and other vessels, have now been recognized as common to the Red Sea region and earned the label of Isla Axum wares, although Aqaba wares are probably a more accurate term. Side note, these things were originally called Isla Axum amphors after their northernmost fine spot at Isla and their southernmost fine spot at Axum in Ethiopia. Now at the discovery of these kilns and other work, we know that these originated in Isla, and since they are in Byzantine Isla and seemingly in early Islamic Isla, uh, we decided to call them by the blanket term Aqaba amphors, even though the place wasn't called Aqaba back then. So rather than calling them Isla Isla amphors, to confuse things with two different spellings, we just use Aqaba amphors. Okay. These kilns that they were found in, however, 
date to the early Islamic period, that is mid 7th and 8th centuries, and not the Byzantine era, which makes me doubt that these things were still being produced later into the early Islamic era. Okay, excavations in the late 1990s, early 2000s revealed several thousand fragments of these amphors produced locally. Uh, and as we mentioned, they're tested throughout the Red Sea Basin and all the way over to India. Uh, at Berenike, recent stratified examples give us a relative date, not an absolute date, but a relative date based on other things within the site to around the year 400, which gives us a very nice date for these amphors around the year 400 that would be let's see beginning of the fifth century late fourth century so we mentioned the original contents of these jars remain unknown particularly at um uh, berenike it's been reasonably supposed that palestinian agricultural products were carried on land to isla then transferred to these amphors for sea transport further south by agricultural products, they mean things like grains and olives and fruits and things like that, not particularly little wine. Now, the ones all found on land are not coated on the inside with resin. Uh, amphors that were carrying wine would be coated on the inside with a uh, terebinthine resin or a pine resin in order to keep the wine from leaching through. Uh, it was a sealant, basically, and the ones found on land do not have this. The ones on the shipwreck at Black Asarka, which is underwater, some of them do have this resin on it, which points to wine transport, at least in some of these. Here, this picture of these ones at Berenike, these are empty, and they're being stored in a storehouse for reuse. Amphors were reused as long as they didn't break, uh, because why not? They're, like reusing a jar for something that you'll do in your own household. Uh, in these places, they would refill them with something and then ship them out again, resealing them, of course, with stoppers. All right. Here's Black Asarka Island, where that shipwreck is that I excavated back in 1997. And Adulis, the port city of the Aksumite Kingdom, is here not very far away this is maybe 30 kilometers 20 miles not far at all okay the port of adulis was one of greatest significance in activity in acti antiquity for the red sea as i mentioned it's a port city for the kingdom of maxim uh, and it's best known for its role in axumite trade during the fourth through seventh centuries a.d it's connected to axum in Ethiopia, the capital, where the king's throne was, by a torturous mountain route. So this area here is flat, but then you get to this escarpment, and you have to go up this escarpment uh, several thousand feet. It was not an easy trip, but these amphors, these Aqaba amphors, made the journey. They were hauling these things first down the Red Sea, unloading them at Dulles, and then over the desert, then up this escarpment, through the mountains, all the way to Axum. Had to be something worthwhile, something desirous inside of them for them to haul these things on camel back all that way. Not to mention hauling them on a ship all that way. It had to be something that was not available in Axum. Well, what was not available in Axum? Well, they had, they had grain. They, they grew their own wheat. They didn't have olives. It's too far out. But they grew other fruits and things like that. But one thing they didn't have was wine. That is grape wine. That honey wine, like a mead, which is still made in the area today, but grape wine they did not have. Adulis is also a major port in the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea that we had mentioned earlier. Um, so it offered a good harbor on the route to India. You could stop off there, unload things, bring some things on, things that you can't get in India, let's say. Certain hides of animals, zebra skins, let's say, lion skins, um, and other things. And we know they traded animal skins out of Adulis. Um, 
So it was a source for luxuries such as ivory, tortoiseshell, and rhinoceros horn. Ivory wouldn't be going to India, where they had their own India, uh, uh, own elephants, but these things, ivory, tortoiseshell, and rhinoceros horns, would be sent up the Red Sea into the Roman Empire, where nice things were made out of these things. In fact, these little islands off the coast here were known to be settled seasonally by turtle hunters. They would hunt sea turtles for their shells and their meat, of course, and they would um, trade that into a duelist where it would be traded out on ships. And we know that from the Periplus of the Erythian Sea. All right, Eritrea and Ethiopia comprise an area which was in ancient times called Abyssinia. They share common cultures and language, which is Semitic and related to South Arabia. As we mentioned, this was an important trading nation uh, in Northeastern Africa, growing from a proto-state in the fourth century to prominence by the first, when it was known by the Romans as one of the four kingdoms of the world, along with Rome, India, China, and the Aksumite Kingdom. And so it was deeply involved in the trade going up and down the Red Sea, out into the Indian Ocean, and up to the Roman Empire. It was a good middleman position. It was a good harbor. Uh, it was well protected from the elements. It had a river there, which has since dried up, so it had fresh water supply. It was basically a good, ideal spot for a harbor. And because of that, the Axum Empire Kingdom became rich and wealthy until the islamic conquest cut off the trade and then it slowly died the axumites retreated from the coast which became islamic and ethiopia remained christian until the present time okay the axum had printed uh, minted its own coins in gold and copper um it uh, converted to Christianity around the year 325 or 328 when it uh, switched from using the crescent moon, which is a Semitic symbol, as it still is today, on its coins and added a cross to it. And when we find coins, we can tell immediately whether they're from the pagan period or the Christian period based on the iconography on the coins. While the throne, that is the royal house, became Christian early on. The rest of the people did not. This took a longer time, but eventually the entire area was converted mostly to Christianity. King Avex soon became a quasi-ally of the Byzantine Empire against the Persians in particular. The Persians were moving into Yemen, um, trying to expand their power base into their such as is going on today with the wars going on in Yemen. A lot of this is driven by Iran, the mullahs in Iran. Uh, so <laughs> the more things change, the more they remain the same. Um, so Axum power declined after the 7th century with the rise of Islam, cutting off trade with the Roman Empire, and it ceased its production of coins in the early 7th century. There was no longer any need for coins because they didn't use them in their own local economy. They were using them for trading with Rome and the other great powers. So once the trade was cut off, the coins stopped. Adulis was important. It became Christian. In fact, there were four churches in Adulis in the Christian period, which testifies not only to the successful conversion of the local peoples, like I said, it didn't happen immediately, but it took some time. Uh, but also the size of the population. If you're only a small seaside village dealing with a few boats coming in now and then, you won't need four churches. But this was a major port in the Southern Red Sea, four churches, and the, um, they needed the uh, local population to serve their spiritual needs and people were obviously drawn into the port city due to its prosperity you have ships coming in trading uh, mer merchants coming down from the highlands trading people trading local goods again a bustling prosperous place lots of people um, and you have this big infrastructure 
building up in the port. And of course, with churches, what do you need for your liturgy? Wine. So this is an impetus for the trade in wine flowing out of Isla Aqaba in those amphors down the Red Sea to Adulis. And again, the churches that were formed in Aksum itself needed wine, which is why they were hauling these amphors full of this liquid over the desert on camels and up this escarpment several thousand feet, and then across the mountain ranges into Aksum. So the Christian period, I believe, and others think so too, created a need for wine, which created the need for trade coming out of Aqaba, which created the need for these specialized Aqaba amphors, which when you'd look at it, you would say, that's liturgical wine in there, because the shape of these jars often told you what was in them. Take a Coca-Cola bottle. You know the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle. Take the labels off of it so it doesn't have anything written on it. You're still going to know that that thing contained Coke. Same thing with these amphors, we believe. The shape of them, the form, tells you what was in them. And in many cases, it would have been wine. And we believe, some of us believe, that this wine was for use primarily in the churches. Theory. But it's a good one, I think. And with all this maritime trade and traffic coming in and out of Adulis, ships were bound to wreck in the area, and at least one did at Black Asarka Island, which you'll be seeing in the next lecture in this course.